uh, good evening everyone uh, on behalf of the team calcutta compact 1919 i take this privilege to warmly welcome you to the 81st lecture of the cc19 lecture series in this platform uh, for your kind information calcutta compact 1919 is an independent forum for research scholar of humanities and social sciences carries the legacy of the academic study of indian languages and literature envisioned by sir ashutosh mukherjee and introduced in 1919 at the premises of calcutta university uh, we are currently organizing online lectures publishing uh, online biography series and uh, academic papers and planning to launch our academic journal very soon with the language course also in different like indian languages uh so uh, we'll um, request everyone and every participant to stay with us for our future endeavors and for both our lectures and everything and i won't take much time today since we heard like already our uh, five minutes late so uh, i'll now request our uh, coordinator arthika ganguly to formally introduce our speaker of the day over to you arthika thank you prati a very warm welcome to all of you a very good evening to all of our participants and a very good morning to professor baisha uh, today professor amit bar baisha will be talking on an attack on the commons species extinction in jairul hussain's rang kukuro tupi i will introduce professor amit baisha now professor uh, baisha is the assistant prof associate professor in the department of english at the university of oklahoma His monograph, Contemporary Literature from Northeast India, Death Walls, Terror, and Survival, was published by Rutledge in 2018. He is also the co-editor of a collection of essays titled Northeast India: Place of Relations, that came out from Cambridge University Press 2017, and Postcolonial Animalities, along with uh, co-editor Shubhodeep Shina, that came out from Rutledge in 2019. He is also editing two special issues currently. First, for the journal Postcolonial Studies, titled "Planetary Politics: Postcolonial Theory in the Era of the Anthropocene and the Non-Human," with Priya Kumar. And second, a special issue titled "Insights Outsights: Anglophone Literatures from Northeast India," for South Asian Review, Uraki Kalita Moran. Professor Boisho translates short stories and novels from Assamese to English. His translation of Devendranath Acharya's Assamese novel *Jangam: The Movement* on the forgotten long march of the Indians from Burma during World War II was released in May 2018. He has also translated a few other short stories from Assamese to English. He specializes in post-colonial literature and cultural studies. Uh, he also teaches courses on post-colonial literature theories, world literature. Cinema, comic books, and popular culture. Uh, he uh, he is also the director of graduate studies department of Indian Chinese University, started from fall 2019. Thank you, Professor Bursha, for joining us today, and very warm welcome to the 81st lecture of the CIS 19 lecture series. Professor, over to you. Not take much of your time now. Let the participants hear your talk, and thank you for joining us today. Right. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. You are audible. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Arutika, and thank you to both you and Pro Team for inviting me, and also to Calcutta Calcutta Comparatist for hosting this. Um, what I'm going to do, of course, is to begin by briefly introducing Jahir Hussain, the writer of the story Rang Kukur Topi. And Rang Kukur means the dhol. Uh, it translates as the dhol or the wild dog, which is probably i mean definitely highly endangered but probably extinct in assam right now but uh, highly endangered in the rest of the north of northeast india as well so i'll begin with an introduction and then i'll go on to look at uh, the question of species extinction in terms of my continuing work on the anthropocene and then i'll read out a section uh, from from a continuing chapter which is called an attack on the commons which is the title of this work okay so let me begin by sharing um um my sharing my screen so that you can have a quick look at certain things here just a second oops oops it's on this one sorry give me one second please i'm just trying to figure this out
Okay, here we go. So here's the title of my talk, of course, right? The Attack on the Common, Attack on the Commons, um, Extinction in Zerul Hussein's Ranka Kurat to be. Um, and this is Zerul Hussein, uh, born in 1941. Uh, he died in 2005. The picture is from his Rasana Bully, which is a collection of all his short stories, a few of his plays, novellas, and also his critical writings. He is known, um, a few details on Hussein, who is also known as Naiska popularly, right? He is known primarily as a short story writer and columnist, although he occasionally wrote poetry plays and novellas as well. He was a member of first the CPIM and later the CPIML. He was imprisoned twice, once for two months in 1975 during the emergency and once for a month in 1979 for his opposition to ethno-nationalism. He's written, um, as I said, I think he's known more as a short story writer in Assamese rather than a novelist or a playwright, although he has a few interesting plays as well. He wrote some powerful short stories like Migoya and Silicon Valley Manu. His two acknowledged masterpieces are Horu Dhamali Bor Dhamali, which I translated as Minor Preludes, Major Preludes. Um, this was published in 2000, and I translated this for Muse India in 2015. And Ran Kukuro Tupi, which is the Dhol Scap, again published in the same collection in 2000, which I'm currently translating right now as an anthology of stories, or Assamese short stories of dogs. And before I go on to Ran Kukuro Tupi, a brief thing about Horu Dhamali Bor Dhamali which I also read in my book, uh, Contemporary Literature of, from Northeast India. This was set, this was a story which was set during the secret killings of Assam uh, between 1998 to 2002 when, you know, suspected militants were sometimes executed extrajudicially and their bodies were often thrown out in the river. So this is a story about a group of little children who uh, fish out one of these unknown sort of corpses. And... In the pocket, they find a photograph. Later, it's revealed to be of that of his mother. But the more interesting thing is that they find a snail that they throw away. The snail appears precisely in three lines in the story. But for me, this was intriguing what the snail actually did. And as you probably learned from Oratrika's introduction, one of my previous publications was on animal theory. In fact, this was the story that kind of pushed me towards animal theory because in many ways, what I tried to think about was that snail, which appears in precisely three lines in that story, what exactly was it doing there? And I thought that that was very often the cipher, the key it to, to unlocking the secrets of that story. So in many ways, I would say that my own interest in animal studies comes out from Zahir Hussain's uh, short story, Horu Dhamali Bor Dhamali, which is something that I had highly recommend because it's a very layered story talking not only about contemporary political violence in Assam, not only talking about animals, but also uses the Obhimannu and the Sokrobehu motif, motif from the Mahabharata as kind of like an organizational structure. So um, the next story, of course, which of, on which his reputation is built is Rangkukuro Tupi, which is the Dhol scat, which I'll talk about today. And here's the Dhol or the Kuan Alpinus in terms of, of linear taxo taxonomy. And um, this, uh, this uh, you know, highly endangered species, which was once quite, which once proliferated quite a bit across South Asia, now you'd only find few numbers, for instance, in Central India and South India, and a few in Northeast India. So basically, this is an animal that is highly endangered. And I want to think about the question of extinction in this slide. And here I'd like to connect this with what I'm doing in my current work, which is a book on deep time in the Anthropocene. And by deep time, of course, I talk not only about times in the past when humans were not present, but also speculative fictions about what could happen when humans exit the scene, right, uh, from, from the planet because of our own collective kind of finitude. So the word Anthropocene, I'm pretty sure a lot of you are aware of it. It's the name of this new geological epoch where humans or human activity is supposed to leave its kind of signature, not only on biosocial life, but on what we can call the whole geohistory of the planet itself. Cli planet, climate warming being its most visible sort of symbol. But if you think about it, 
There are many other factors to the Anthropocene as well. And one of them is what is called the sixth great extinction event. So I have a chapter in this continuing book, which is about species extinction. And uh, among the South Asian texts that I read, I've paired Rangkukuru Tupi with Ministry of Utmost Happiness by, by Arunthati Roy. And uh, for those of you who've read Arunthati Roy, you'll you, you remember that it begins with a coda where vultures and sparrows go extinct. And that becomes kind of like a cipher for reading the novel as a whole. And just like in my reading of Zeri Lusen's Horud Himali, Bord Himali, where the snail, which appears only in three lines of the story, became the cipher for reading it. In my reading of um, Ministry of Utmost Happiness, I do something similar. I use the, the vultures and the sparrow to think about some of the, the major concerns in the text. And I contrast this, of course, with uh, Hussein's uh, Ranko Kuratupi. And then the second part of the chapter talks about a few Australian and Tasman or rather Tasmanian texts about the extinction of, of animals. So that's like the larger context of how I'm trying to read this in my book. We can talk more about this during the Q&A. What I'll do now, of course, is read out a portion from, um, from my chapter, which is titled An Attack on the Commons, Species Extinction in Zehrul Hussein's Rangkukura Tupi. So defining feature of the Anthropocene epoch is the sixth great mass extinction event. We are witnessing a mass extinction, which has happened only five times earlier in the planet's 3.5 billion years history. The unique feature of this extinction event is that it is driven primarily by anthropogenic factors. While species loss is undoubtedly important from a scientific, scientific perspective, as a literary critic, I'm interested in the narrative frameworks to which stories of extinction are conveyed. Scholars from the humanities focusing on extinction emphasize that it is a biocultural phenomenon. This is from Extinction Studies by Deborah Bird Rose, uh, Tom Van Duren, and Matthew Cherlu. Uh, and that biodiversity, endangered species, and extinction are primarily cultural issues, questions of what we value and what stories we tell, and only secondarily issues of science. This is a line from Ursula Heise's Against Extinction. Moreover, Extinction narratives show some crucial ways in which animals are cultural tools and agents in humans thinking is about themselves, their communities, their histories, and their futures. In this particular paper today, I'll read Zehrul Hussein's Asami short story, Rang Kukur Tupi or the Dhol's Cap, utilizing this critical lens of extinction. So first and foremost, I'd like to begin by placing my reading of the story within contemporary critical trends in my knowledge field of Northeast Indian studies. I outlined two major trajectories on human-animal relations in North Northeast Indian studies. I distinguish my focus on extinction from these two trajectories. First, discourses on conservation and human-animal conflict predominate in this knowledge field. You can read people like Arupjati Sakya, or Hanjay Borbora for that. The primary orientation here is humanist and studies are informed by social justice concerns. While biodiversity is considered, the tendency is to speak more for the interest of disenfranchised human populations. And I'll come to Arubhati Sakya's work later on to, to explain this a little bit in greater detail. Second, while few studies deal with smaller animals, for instance, Sean Dowdy's essay in our edited book, uh, on Northeast India, a, 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 a place of relations where he writes about fish or mythical animals, like Michael Hanaise writes about the were tigers of, of Nagaland. Generally, the critical focus has been on megafauna like elephants. Manborua's work here is very, very crucial. Or familiar animals like dogs, here Dolly Kikon and my own work obviously would fit in. The focus on megafauna, or familiar animals is not surprising because as post-colonial animal theorist Neil Ahuja writes, companion animals, farmed animals, and charismatic wildlife species, physiologically close enough to humans for us to imagine certain interests appear most often in animal studies. Studies of human-animal relationships in Northeast Indian studies are no exceptions. Within this framework, we noticed humanist approaches that emphasize the agency an interest of racialized populations, like Dolly Kikon's work. Uh, she wrote this wonderful essay really on, on uh, dogs as food, which came out in two different fora. 
And post-humanist ones that emphasize the agency and co-constitution of the human and the non-human. And Manburwa's work here, especially on elephants and alcohol, is a useful uh, kind of essay to think about, where he talks about both the volatility of elephants and the agency of objects like alcohol. Right. My focus on extinction goes in a different direction. I concentrate on how extinct or endangered animals are cultural tools and agents in humans thinking about themselves, as opposed to predominantly humanist orientations of studies of conservation. Moreover, I move away from charismatic or familiar animals to illustrate how the disappearance of relatively unfamiliar animals lead to the mutual impoverishment of human and non-human worlds. The animal I focus here on is the wild dog or dhol in Linnean taxonomy, Quan alpinus. The dhol is at a double disadvantage in both the critical frameworks elaborated above. Earlier, this Pleistocene era hunter used to proliferate across the subcontinent. An estimated 2,500 doe tolls now exist in India, mostly in central and northeast India, because it does not fit the paradigm of a national icon like the tiger or the rhino. It is rarely a target for conservation efforts. Relatively small, non-charismatic, and secretive, it does not conjure epic narratives of human animal and interactions either. Although it's had a literary genealogy that I'll talk about more. And here I must say that I'm, I thank uh, the conservationist Ian Campbell for extended conversations on email with me about dhol conservation in or uh, the presence of dholes, for instance, in Northeast India. He actually gave me a lot of reading material, which helped me think a little bit about the presence of dholes in Northeast India. The decline in dhol numbers has occurred due to anthropogenic factors. Although occasional sightings are reported in Assam, Naturalist Anwaruddin Chaudhary reports spotting footprints in Nambo Reserve Forest, which is in the borders of Golaghat and Kar Karbiangong district in 1993. And keep this name in mind, Nambo, because this is the setting of the of Rangpura to be. Dhol are highly endangered, if not extinct in Assam. They are considered pests by local populations because of their propensity for livestock depredation. They are still found in Arunachal Pradesh. The numbers are decreasing due to a decreasing prey base, destruction of habitat, and retaliatory, retaliatory killings from livestock predation. This is from Kamler's essay. Social perceptions of dholes also tend to be negative. Losses of feral cattle due to perceived depredation by dholes has generated a social hatred towards the species, especially in Arunachal Pradesh. Now, this is beyond my ken, but while multi species ethnographies may unravel, Ambivalent human attitudes beyond hatred, like what Deborah de Bird Rose, the Australian scholar, does in her wonderful con consideration of Australian dingoes in her book Wild Dog Dreaming. This approach is beyond my disciplinary training and care. As a literary scholar, I turn to narrative figurations of dholes in literary fi fi fictions instead. So let me try to trace a sort of partial genealogy. I'm sure that there are lots of works that I have missed, but what I'd like to do, of course, is to try to trace a certain genealogy of the dholes as it exists in literature. Literary works have institutionalized certain images of the dholes in public perception. When dholes figure in narratives, they appear either as ferocious, cruel killers that hand in packs, as in the depiction of the red peril in Rudyard Kipling's Mowgli short story, Red Dog, or as clever, courageous, and tenacious beings that wear down larger prey in hunting memoirs like Kenneth Anderson's Nine Man Eaters and One Rogue. Now, for those of you who may have read Red Dog by Kipling, um, this is where the wolf, Akela, finally dies because of a vicious dhole attack, right? So the idea of the red peril, the dholes hunting in packs, is something which comes up a lot in that short story as well. Kenneth Anderson's depiction of dholes in Nine Man Eaters and the Rogue is symptomatic as it depicts their so-called tenacity, courage, and cruelty. And this is a long passage from uh, Nine, Matter, Nine Man Eaters in, and a Rogue, but I'm going to read this out in full so that we can kind of think a little bit about the perceptions about dholes which are there. This is Anderson. Suddenly, I heard a medley of sounds whose origins I could not at first define. There were cries, yelps, and long drawn bays, interspersed with grunts and woofs that puzzled me. Then I knew that the noise was that of wild dogs or the dhole, which seemed to be attacking a pig or a bear. 
Grabbing my rifle, I ran in the direction of the din. I may have covered a furlong when around the corner dashed a tigress, encircled by half a dozen wild dogs. Concealing myself behind the trunk of a tree, I watched the unusual scene. The dogs had spread themselves around the tigress, who was growling ferociously. Every now and again, one would dash in from behind to bite her. She would then turn to attempt to rend asunder this puny aggressor when a couple of others would rush in from another direction. In this way, she kept, was kept on going continually, and I could see that she was becoming fast spent. All this thought at the time, the dogs were making a tremendous noise, the reason for which I soon came to know when in a lull in the fray, I heard the whistling cry of the main pack, galloping to the, to the assistance of their advance party. The tigress must also have heard the sound, for in a sudden renewed fury, she charged two of the dogs, one of which she caught a tremendous blow on its back with her paw, cracking its spine with a sharp retort, report of a broken twig. The other just managed to leap out of danger. The tigress then followed up her momentary advantage by bounding away, to be immediately followed by the five remaining dogs. They were just out of sight when the main pack streamed by, in which I counted 23 dogs, as they galloped past me without the slightest interest in my presence. Soon the sounds of pursuit died away, and all that remained was the one dead dog. During the affair, I had been too interested and too lost in admiration in the courage of dogs to fire at either the tigers or her attackers. Next morning, I sent out scouts to discover the result of the incident. They returned about noon, bringing a few fragments of tiger skin to report that the dogs had finally cornered their exhausted quarry about five miles away and had literally torn the tigers to pieces. As far as they could gather, five dogs had been killed in the final battle after which the victors had eaten the tigress and even the greater portions of their own dead companions. Now this long passage which I read out encapsulates a few crucial features that shape enduring public perceptions on tolls. First, the tolls are characterized more by sound and noise, cries and yelps, than by actual sightings. The cry of the packs in unison has often endowed them the label of whistling hunters. Second, when the dhol comes into the range of the visual, what strikes the observer is the sheer tenacity and proliferation in numbers offset by their puny size as individuals. The dhol pack wears down bigger prey through their persistence and tenacity. Finally, anthropomorphic projections like courage or cruelty abounds when it comes to dholes, evident both in the passages above and also if you read the depiction of the red peril in Kipling's The Red Hunter. In fact, one of the things which often horrifies or in reports about hunting or reports about looking at or watching the holes, which often horrifies, for instance, people, is the fact that the holes often consume their prey while alive. So this is why the attribution of cruelty is often given to holes. And this, of course, comes back briefly also in Rankukur or Tupi. So I'm going to read out one passage, which is narrated sensationally by Joranto, one of the primary protagonists of Rangkukurotopi, and this is my translation. There would be about 15 to 20 members in a Rangkukur pack. They were very ferocious. They would attack somber deer, which was almost twice their size. They would tear away a piece of flesh with each bite. They would keep chasing the deer, issuing such bites on their flesh periodically. The exhausted prey would finally flop on the ground. The pack would then surround it completely and attack it from above. In a jiffy, they would tear the flesh of their fallen prey and strip it nearly to the bone. Even the bones would disappear. Now, zoologist Michael W. Fox, who wrote a classic work on holes, warns against these anthropomorphic attributions of cruelty to holes. He writes, horrified by their mode of dealing with its prey, one Indian resident active in humane care in the district regards the wild dog as simply treacherous and vicious. Even educated people have to be taught to see the cold realities of nature without anthropomorphic judgment. While some amount of anthropomorphism may be unavoidable in animal representations, Fox, however, provides a useful way to conceptualize questions about extinction and its impact alternatively. He says that Homo sapiens was once a hunter and has closer affinities with the wolf than one might imagine. Studying pack hunters like the holes, he says, may reveal more about evolutionary aspects 
of human biological and social behavior than animals that seem closer to us like primates, who are primarily vegetarians and rarely hunt. Fox's argument is not related to metaphysical shibboleths that naturalize the lupine nature of the human. As you know, homo homini lupus, homo homini deus is the way in which Thomas Hobbes often defines human nature, for instance, in DC way, but also about how contemporary comparative ethology may shed light on the evolutionary trajectories of some forms of social behavior. If the whole becomes extinct, Besides the loss to complex ecosystems, we lose the valuable opportunity to understand aspects of our evolutionary histories. Fox's formulations here shares affinities with what the extinction studies scholar Tom Van Duren calls the dull edge of extinction, in which there is a slow unraveling of intimately entangled ways of life that begins long before the death of the last individual and continues to ripple forward long afterwards, drawing in living beings in a range of different ways. I would argue that literary narratives are uniquely positioned to explore these entangled co-constitutive processes that characterize the dull edge of extinction over the long duration. So let me now cut to Assamese narratives. Right. While modern literary narratives in Assamese often place ecological concerns at the forefront, fiction, especially in the recent years, I'm talking about the post-2000 period, has been increasingly concerned with representations of the antinomies of conservation, questions of biodiversity, and relationships with megafauna. I can give you some examples. For instance, Dilip Chandon's novel, uh, Kazirongar Ballad, talks about conservation. For biodiversity, you can look at Pankaj Govindamedi's novel, Sarai Saburi. And for, for megafauna, you can look at depictions of human element elephant relationships in novels like Urbak Potongya Kolita's Dukura Bahor Hon Hunar Bezi and Prabhadu Sami's Hula Hatir Khoz. I mean, these are, there are a lot more, but these are some of the recent publications that, of course, talk about some of these issues. Extinction, though, is rarely represented. When extinction is featured, as in Minal Kolita's short story, Ketla Puhur Kite, or The Porcupine's Quill, which was published in 2014, the near extinct porcupine functions as a symbolic substitute for time's passing and a mirror for the finitude of an individual life. The porcupine itself does not play a direct style role. Now, you could probably say this is true of something like Rang Kukuro Tupi. The only thing is because actually in the story, an actual dhol never appears. It's always referred to. But the very power of the dhol or the wild dog in the story comes precisely through its absence. It is the sort of structuring kind of node in the story overall, as opposed to a mere small structural element like the in Ketlaka or Trukai. Therefore, I consider the most complex depiction of extinction in Assamese literature to be Hussein's story, which has the absent presence of the extinct hole in Nambor Forest as its organizational center. Its obvious inspiration is Sunil Gangopadhyay's novella, Oranir Dinratri, which was later made, as we all know, in an acclaimed film by Satyajit Ray, about a group of urban youth who want to escape civilization and the humdrum nature of the quotidian by traveling to a forest. Readers of Oranya Dinrati will also recognize the resonances in the plot of, of Ranku Tupi. His story too is about a group of disaffected, cynical, middle-class youth traveling to the eco-archaic space of the forest to escape the banalities of ur everyday urban life. The, the story has five characters. The major one is Jointa, right? But his other friends, Orup, Shakil, Pritam, and, um, and Ikram, they uh, go for like a weekend visit to Nambor Forest. Jundas uh, belongs to an old kind of uh, landowner's family. He, he, he wants to take his friends out to this, this area where his grandfather once was a hunter and so on. Uh, hardly any events per se in the story, but it's a lot of like sharing of, of stories around the fireside and so on, right? But of course, the, the, the entire plot of the story is structured by the absence of the hole itself, right? The translator of Orinet Dinrati, Rani Ray, writes that finding themselves in a strange and unknown place, the four protagonists of the novel see the world through the prism of civilization. An actual sunset seen to the youth reminiscent of scenes in Western movies. They realize the imagined sunset only in films. Similarly, the five young men in Rangkukura Tupi, and I quote from the story again, wanted to be wild, like primitive men at least for a day, 
After snatching a few memories from the green bosom of the forest, they would slink and lose themselves again in the anonymity of the concrete jungle. Moreover, the actual trip to the forest is enlivened in their imagination by cliched comparisons to common scenarios from thrillers and horror films. For instance, Ikram says, we'll act imagining that the deep forest surrounds all of us. We will create the atmosphere using cassettes. Our hair will stand at the end. Our hair will stand at the at, at end at the prospect of the approach of terrifying beasts. Sounds of the tiger and leopard, of the rang kukur and the pheasants, will play on the cassette. We'll run away. Terror will be writ large in our eyes. So it's almost like the world seen in the picture of a horror movie, right? These representations of urban alienation and anomie and destruction of habitats has been one of the central notes of interpretations of Hussein's story. For example, if you think about Hiren Guhai's reading of the story in 2010 or Kamaluddin Ahmed's reading of the story in 2015. For roads not taken, and here I'll take a slight diversion, right? Rangkukur Tupi can also be read in line with the historian Urukjoti Soikya's discussion of the history of Nambor and the Doyang region as a narrative about the conflict between state and people, between humans and elephants, and the imperatives of biodiversity and human settlement and displacement. And here's my brief aside. Nambor was de declared a reserve forest by the, by the colonial government in 1878. Besides deforestation that occurred due to the imperatives of modernization, such as railway construction, which began during colonial times, the gradual diminution of forest cover in Nambor should be located within competing claims over forest, forested and agrarian land by both the colonial and post-colonial state and the peasants. Here, Orubjati Saikya writes that peasant migration, and this includes both resettled pet peasants from East Bengal and landless peasants from other parts of Assam who were resettled here, and a gradual reclamation of forested areas in Nambor in the 20th century caused its dense forest coverage till now. As these forests came under increasing human intervention and greater agricultural activity, the conflict between the two frontiers of agrarian and forest boundaries became prominent. The conflict between the state and its resettled peasants has its roots in an attempt to control nature in the frontiers by the colonial state and continued in the post-colonial era. Resettled peasants are often stigmatized as encroachers and evicted. And this is, of course, a discourse that you see a lot around Kaziranga now, very often uh, with, with the focus on the quote-unquote Bangladeshi sort of migrant as well, right? An interesting fact here would be that Zahirul Hussain, who was a left-leaning intellectual, right? He also wrote an article in 2004 titled Doyangar Andolan, both about his involvement in mobilizing the peasants in the neighboring Doyang area and his analysis of the failure of the Naxalites to rise, rouse the people into action. Remember that it also, what this, this kind of protest did was that it also endowed the peasants with forms of political agency and a measure of power to negotiate with the state. And here, Purubjoti Sarkia continues, many of these movements had come forward with contesting notions of development and conservation, where the coexistence of the human and nature was more than possible. However, despite the proposition of an alternative form of conservation by the peasants, and the inability of the state to accommodate this notion into practice, the conflict between the agrarian and the forest frontiers in the 1980s remained an unresolved dilemma. This provided the peasants with ample political illegitimacy to continue to lay claim over, over forested lands, often to the detriment of forest cover. The reason I read this out is that while we can say that the extinction of dholes, the question of conservation and biodiversity, for instance, are anthropogenic affairs, Remember that when we are talking, for instance, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that this is a this is a concept we read a lot, or or a narrative that we read a lot in postcolonial ecocriticism as well, that there are much more complicating factors between humans and animals when we talk about the question of biodiversity, rather than let's say human incursions into some kind of unsullied nature. It's a co-constitutive process, and I think in some ways what we need to keep in mind that the question of extinction, animal rights, and so on, is inextricably connected with what we can call animal human rights as well. And this dual duality needs to be kept in mind as we go on. And one last thing before I come back to my reading of the story, you could also read this story as a kind of, you know, a story about the relationships between humans and elephants, which of course has a long kind of history in Assamese fiction. Some of you 
uh, before this began, we talked about Indira Goswami Jatra, which briefly talks a little bit about human animal relationships. But there are lots of novels, for instance, about human animals, uh, uh, humans and animals like Probi Bormudoy's uh, Gajaraj uh, Premar Bandito, or the two other novels that are talked about by Prabhupada Goswami and, and uh, Oropa Patongya Kolita. So you could read Rangkugur or Tupi also within that light because one of the features of Nambor is of course that when you drive through it, you'll see a lot of elephants coming in, many of them emaciated, right? Many of them driven out from their own habitat, so to speak, and they come and eat bananas and so on from, from, from tourists, right? And of course, this often creates conflict if you think about it between people who have settled for peasantry and the elephants at different points of time. So it's a much more complicated picture about the human elephant ele aspect as well. But that's a different byline which I'm not following here. So I finished my essay. Along with the species loneliness of what we call Homo sapiens in the Anthropocene as a result of accelerating extinction, these conflicts between states and people, human and populations and animals, and the gradual diminution of forest cover in number is part of what Ashley Dawson in Extinction and Radical History calls a global attack on the commons, which is where I get the title of my paper. The great trove of air, water, plants, and collectively created cultural forms such as language. So let's keep this notion of commons in mind, not just the great trove of air, water, plants, and collect, but also collectively created cultural forms such as language. We'll come to back to that in the story. Readings of Rangkura Tupi can be pushed further to a consideration of the whole, which is hardly ever contended with in readings and critical readings of the story. The probably extinct dhol is paradoxically hypervisible due to constant references to it in the story, while it simultaneously haunts the story space as an absent presence. Dhol circumnavigate the symbolic space of the story in various ways. Stereotypically lurid details about its negative image in public memory are occasionally discussed by the characters, as in the passage I quoted below about uh, quoted above about Kenneth Anderson's depiction of dholes. Similarly, allusions to its supposed fierceness and cruelty are invoked to counterpoint the deleterious effects of anthropogenic bestiality. The metaphorical invocation of the ferocity of the dhol is connected directly with deforestation and extractive capitalism. As in Oranir Dinnatri, the, the sonic background of the story alludes to the felling of trees and the loss of forest cover. At one key point though, the characters conflate the sound of the felling of trees with the baying of a pack of dholes. One of the members of the group, Ikram, hears an eerie sound in the heart of the forest. He asks Jyanta whether this eerie sound is the baying of the dhol pack. Jyanta pricks his ears, listens carefully, laughs out loud, and leads them to the source of the noise. And I quote from the story. In the moonlight, they saw a huge truck standing in the middle of the forest like some prehistoric beast. Jorinda smiled and said, so, do you know, so you know now where the sound came from. It's the sound of trees being felled. That's the sound of the new machines that helps you cut through wood easily. Don't talk loudly. They may attack us in fear if they see us. Timber smugglers also have lethal weapons with them. They are much more terrifying than a pack of Rangukur. This passage, and here's my interpretation, of course, um, this passage begins with a fusion of temporalities as an appurtenance of modernity, the huge truck is equated with the prehistoric beast. As we work our way through the passage, the metaphorical contrast with the pack of holes become clearer. Just like the pack of holes presumably leave nothing behind from their felled prey, the timber smugglers denude the forest with their new machines. But the pack of smugglers, this passage implies, are more terrifying than the Ram Kukur. While the holes hunt for food and sustenance, the human holes erase a history of human non-human co-constitution. However, the more complex exploration of the dull age of extinction emerges to a subtle symbolic economy that weaves humans, animals, and objects together. This emerges clearly through the representation of the lead character, Jernto's grandfather's expensive cap. Remember the title of the story is Rang Kukura Tupi, Tupi's cap, made with wool of the finest quality. The smell of the old cap evoked memories of Jonta's father and grandfather. Jonta still found the smell of elephant hunts, elephant traps, and mahouts in it. The cap is a nostalgic object, invoking the memory of bygone days, 
to the activation of the haptic and the olfactory senses. This nostalgic invocation is contrasted with the closure with the desire of Joel's four friends to click a photograph with a person they consider an anachronistic museumized entity. A poor drunk Carby person about 40 dressed in ethnic clothing with whom they can hardly communicate because they didn't, don't understand his language. And this for me is the key passage in Ranko Kuroto. Peace, I'll read it out in full. Shakil very hospitably took out a cigarette from his pocket, placed it in the man's mouth and lighted it. The person's face lighted up. He began puffing on the cigarette very contentedly. Jonda said, Kardo Makohai, Nangli ke konat pensi kongli. He greeted him in Karbi and asked him where he came from. The person replied in a language which seemed completely alien to Orup and the rest. Only Jonda could follow it somewhat. Orup queried, isn't he feeling cold? We are still shivering, even though we are warmly clad. Jonda replied, these pure poor people are used to a lack of clothes. No clothes, no cold. Let's take his snap. The rest said bravo to Ikram's proposal. Ikram gave his stamp camera to Jonto. Jonto, take the camera. Let us first come into the frame. The four of them surrounded the person. The person understood that they wanted to take a picture with him. He must have had the experience of being entrapped by a camera much prior to Ikram's attempt. Jonto took the camera from Ikram and prepared to take the snap. He was about to push the shutter when he suddenly halted. Wait a while. I'm not going to be in the photograph. Therefore, let my cap be a sign of my presence. Let this cap from my great grandfather's days stay as a sign on his head, much like Gottwald in Kundera's story. As soon as he wore the cap, the person sported a big smile on his ruddy face. Jonda placed his hand on the shutter. Click. The light, fell from the, flash, the light from the flash fell on the faces of Orup and company. And this is the last line in the story. Joram Da smiled and muttered indiscernibly, the Rang Kukur's cap or the Rang Kukur's tupi, which is the title of the story. So let's get to an analysis of this very complex sort of closing sequence in the story. The passage begins with an animalization of the indigenous person. Remember what Joram says, no clothes, no cold. Furthermore, as the Moroccan bilingual writer, Abdul Fattah Kilito in his famous essay, Dog Word says, when two languages meet, one of them is necessarily linked to animality, speak like me or be considered animal. Foreignness itself, as in this story, is defined in terms of animality from the perspective of the middle class viewer. This is emphasized when the narrator says, they ask the poor, tribal person wearing a strange dress a few questions, but could not understand his alien tongue. Alien tongue, or Dasanese, Nurbundavakha, alludes to the animalization of the other's language. The urban youth desire a photographic memento with this animalized other with whom they are unable to communicate. The photograph, as the, the French critic André Bazin says, Always, uh, 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 the French critic Andre Bazan says, embalms time. It arrests a living moment into a frozen image that oscillates ambivalently between life and death. The living dead quality of the photograph is accentuated by the laconic reference that the Carby person had the experience of being entrapped, the Assamese is Bondihua by a camera, right? So this idea of entrapment by the camera, Bondihua by the camera, so to speak. The Jointa does not want to participate in this attempt at spectacularizing what the other, his other friends perceive as the eco arcade. The only object he leaves as a trace of his presence is the cap, which he places on the unnamed person's head. The comparison with the extinct hole becomes more intricate with another intertextual reference. In the opening scene of Milan Kundera's, the book of laughter and forgetting, the Czech communist leader Gottwald stands before a massive crowd next to his comrade Clementis. The narrator writes, it was snowing and cold and Gottwald was bareheaded. Bursting with solicitude, Clementis took off his fur hat and set it on Gottwald's head. The photograph of the two men became famous, but a few years later, the party executes Clementis and airbrushes him from the photograph. The narrator of Kundel's novel continues, ever since Gottwald has been alone on the balcony, where Clementis stood, there is only the bare palace wall. Nothing remains of Clementis but the fur hat on Gottwald's head. 
Propaganda ensures the memory of Clementis is foreclosed as if he never existed. The struggle of a man against power, the narrator of uh, Book of Laughter and Forgetting says, is a struggle of memory against forgetting. But there is a presence of Clementis still in a photograph, and that is the far gap. Kundera's novel crit critiques the power of propaganda to rewrite memory and ensure forgetting. The analogy with Gottwald in Rankopra TP impels us to consider species extinction with this struggle of memory against forgetting. Initially, Jonda refers to the cap with the possessive my. The cap will be a trace of his presence behind the camera in the photographic crypt. But the possessive my merges the untimely eruption of his grandfather's days when dholes roamed through Nambor. So the cap is also the portal to another history. Nothing remains of the dholes, but they're traced in a cap, which is a non-human attestant to their prior presence. By non-human attestant, literary critic Daniel Williams, in his essay on J.M. Kutzea's uh, Dusklands, refers to a bearers of a testimony that issues from a non-human world while reflaming human projects. Non-human attestants help disclose the narrative ethical and ecological work performed by peripheral objects, showing the necessary entanglement of human and non-human concerns. A seemingly peripheral object, a cap, functions as the untimely eruption of lost presences into the temporal space of the present. The dawn, the holds haunt the, the text as specters, but through their physical absence, reveal the impoverishment of a multi-species ecosystem. Furthermore, Jointo's indiscernible statement at the end equates the extinction of a species with a disavowal and a lack of relationality towards specific four ways and forms of being. The smiling Carby person will remain as a living dead memento of an ecotourist experience, an exotic detail seemingly without history and biography for the future audience of the photograph. The dull edge of extinction exposes an erasure of productive possibilities of being in common with both humans and non-humans. It is not only species that are becoming extinct in Rangugra to be, but as Felix Botari says memorably in the three ecologies, words, phrases, and gestures of human solidarity too. So I'd like to conclude by comparing this with my reading of Ministry of Utmost Happiness, which if you read the novel, you'll realize that it ends with a kind of utopian formation of a queer multi-species community, right? This happens in Janet Guest House. So while vulture and sparrow extinction is used as a cipher for thinking about disappearing populations in the work, it also ends with this kind of utopian gesture, one where effectively um, a queer collectivity and also what we could call a multi-species collectivity comes into formation in Janet Guest House. One of the best Scenes of that is not only the illustration of the vultures and the sparrows at the end of the book, but also Guikyong, or what you call the dung beetle, right? Which ends the, the which ends uh, the scene with the dung beetles that ends the novel. Rangkukura Tupi is a different biosocial narrative, and this is why I contrast this, which is more about forgetting and the loss of relationality. What is the cost of this loss? I end with a quotation from Jairus Groves. Savage ecologies, where he says forms of life, and these need not necessarily be human alone, carry with them means for inhabiting Earth that exceed the monotechnological thinking of contemporary global development. Homogenization entails a restriction of our socio technical horizons. The expanses of possible human non human alliances lost in the singularity of our current ecological apocalypse is unknowable in an unusual way. Each lost alliance or form of life means a future that can no longer come about. The geopolitical advance of homogenization is killing futures as it strangles the present. And in fact, the way I would like to end is to say that the closure of Rankukuro to be, right, through the invocation of whole extinction, while it talks about the strangling of the present, right, an attack on the commons, it is also in some sense an aspect of killing particular types of futures that could be life-sustaining as well. So on that note, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much for inviting me. And if you want to open it up for questions at this point, I'm ready. For you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your outstanding presentation. And indeed, a new area which you have been about today. Uh, 
Uh, we have uh, right now. We have the one question with us. Uh, so, uh, if you permit, we can take this question yeah. and start yeah. our session. So, the first question is from King Shook, yeah. and King Shook uh, asking about the hunting narrative of Assam, if there's any, and uh, uh, he also uh, asking that uh, did hunting ever cause extinction of species in Assam. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, I think perhaps uh, King Shuk is hinting towards the uh, Kaziranga area and like how the uh, species are, uh, I mean, getting endangered with the like hunters and like during the like during the hunting occasions and everything. So mm -hmm. I think uh, King Shuk's concern is perhaps from there. So if you like to answer a comment. Well, in terms of hunting narratives, of course, quite a number of them, right? There are quite a number of them. And uh, one could say that on the one hand, um, you could definitely think about hunting narratives through, through, through different angles, right? One is that hunting narratives are very often couched within this idea of what we call the adventure narrative, which is, you know, the human kind of dominating nature. It is in some sense, in, in, in its sense, if you think about it, the hunting narrative becomes a narrative of, of anthropocentric sovereignty, right? I mean, you see that element, for instance, coming also in, just to veer away from a novel that I often teach, which is King Solomon's Mines. In chapter four, if you read of King Solomon's Mines, for instance, is about the hunting of elephants and, and it's described in lurid detail. It's also in some sense about human supremacy, so to speak. And a lot of the colonial narratives, you think about it, right? A lot of the colonial narratives about hunting in Assam and so on, are definitely predicated within that framework, right? However, there are other ways in which questions of hunting could also be thought about in terms of like the close intimacy between human and animal. And again, I'm not going to make a distinction between, let's say, colonial narratives and more quote unquote locally based narratives as, as if they show very different worldviews. Many locally based you know, narratives are also couched within this question of, of what, what you would call, you know, um, uh, hunting in a sense. But if you read something like Urba Potangia Kolita's novel, which I mentioned, Dukra Bahor, uh, uh, it's interesting in the way in which it talks about particular forms, for instance, of elephant hunting, which used to exist, for instance, in the indo Bhutan borderlands. In fact, you could even go back to, let's say, early modernity, the late medieval period, where there was a manual for hunting elephants, which is called the Hostibidernoko, right? So there are ways, for instance, about hunting and taming animals, which are not quite within that colonial episteme per se, right? So there's a more complicated thing that can that can come out in terms of more local narratives about hunting and so on and so forth, right? And clearly, uh, not just in As Assamese fiction, a, a brilliant narrative in this sense is Temsula Al's The Hunter, right? Which one of my... Uh, a person I work with, Jyoti Kolita, is actually writing a very interesting essay on that. So there's a way in which you can definitely think about hunting otherwise than this colonial, sovereign, anthropocentric standpoint. That's one part of it, right? Uh, because one of the things about human-animal relations, let's put it this way, right? I love a line that Pratika Govindarajan has in Animal Encounters, that you have to think about human and animal encounters not only through warm, fuzzy feelings, like, you know, feeding stray dogs, feeling good about it and stuff like that, but also through its more decidedly uninnocent aspects, right? In some ways, there are many uninnocent aspects through which humans and animals relate with each other. And that is part of relationality as well. Relationality is not simply about warm and fuzzy feelings alone. Having said that, Right, trying to do the, the whole complicating factor that we are talking about in some sense. Do read Prabhat Goswami's novel as well, which could be an interesting way in terms of thinking not only about elephant hunting, but also about elephant taming, so to speak, in some ways, right? Has hunting in some ways led to extinction, which is the second part of the question. Of course it has, many species it has, so to speak. Yet one of the things we do often is that we kind of focus only on the extinction of keystone species, right? Here the rhino becomes a classic example, right? If you think about it, there's a lot of concern about the extinction of the rhino. But if you think about it, I mean, both Orup and and, and uh, Sanjay Barbara have written about it in some ways that 
The rhino is also a peculiarly bourgeois symbol. It comes as an idea, as an animal, as a big animal, right? It's kind of like figured as a national animal of Assam and so on, right? But this is also a recent phenomenon if you think about it. And it comes in some sense to this idea of preserving a national heritage, so to speak, in some way, right? So obviously the focus, if you think about it in terms of extinction, will be on keystone species, on charismatic species like tigers and so on and so forth. Whereas a lot of these other animals which remain uncharismatic, we can definitely think about the Amur falcon, for instance, in Nagaland and so on, right? That many of these uncharismatic animals are also being driven extinct, and the toll is one of them, so to speak, right? Which doesn't quite garner the same kind of what you could call, um, you know, response in the national and the local media, although people do talk about it in different angles. And not only hunting, which is, of course, the only reason for which you know animals disappear you could also think in some sense even about the formation of elements like national parks which of course reconfigure space it becomes this eco archaic space where we go to watch animals in their quote unquote natural timeless beauty but what it does of course is it's an essential reorganization of space as well and this is what comes up and this is what i tried to caution people in terms of thinking about the romanticization of nature especially in places like number and so on and when we saw, talk about people like population conflict with let's say with 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 conservation factors there are a lot of other complicating factors involved than simply the question of encroachment or hunting alone. And I think this is where local concerns about how human-animal relations develop are something that need to be taken into, into, into equation as well, rather than, let's say, an overarching view that all conservation efforts are, quote-unquote, noble animals. Also remember that when we say animals need our protection, right, that's a very sovereign impulse as well. It's like the, the protection that we often give to children, so to speak, or to inferior beings, so to speak. That's all, also a kind of anthropocentric element there. So now, I think there's a lot of complex complications there in terms of hunting, driving things to extinction, animals to extinction. Of course it does, right? And that has gone on for a long period of time. We have to think about colonial ideologies, its implication with ideas of masculinity, the con conquest of nature, with other forms of imaginaries about hunting that exist in the region, some of them destructive, but some of them which are interestingly, what we can say, almost multi, a certain form of multi-species relation, relationality comes in. And then of course, even the complications around questions of, of conservation and so on. So that's kind of like a, my whole roundabout answer to your question. Okay, uh, right now I have um, I mean one or two things to ask. Like since you have been mentioning that uh, this is like we have been seeing the recent mm. phenomenon. Mm. I mean, uh, the thing I want to ask here is like this. I mean, the literary representation of animals, like which is like taking place. Uh, we uh, we might uh, see that this trend is like uh, getting emerged during nineteen like seventies or eighty onwards. Like as a uh, like. Uh, uh, Graham have been like has been described. So, do you think like uh, this uh, phenomenon of like extinction and everything is like uh, due to the uh, due to like the like in humanities on like or other disciplines they are like sort of feeling the urge of discussing these sort of things due to like the uh, growing environmental crisis they are facing or in order to like preserve since you were like mentioning. Uh, Ministry of Utmost Happiness, like Arundhati Rai is also like in his fictional masterpiece, like mentioning range, I mean, different issues ranging from the vulture crisis or like the, this, I mean, the captivated Jew animals and everything. So do you think like, uh, since more or more like these days we are like discussing about the calamities and the nature is like taking a revenge on us and everything. So do you think that's why like in uh, humanities uh, or in disciplines like we are sort of uh, talking about these sort of things and that's why like do, after 1980s like these species extinction and everything and the culture, I mean the representation is coming in literature uh, during from that time. Also, I would like to, um, I mean, know more about the Assamese uh, context, like when, uh, from when, like you can get to see that Assamese people are like talking about these species ex extinctions and everything. So that is my first question here. 
I would like to answer your question by going both backwards and forwards, right? Let's say, let's first start going backwards. Representations of animals or of environment, really, if you think about it, although critical discourse has come more recently, it's not a recent phenomenon, right? You could read it backwards even into earlier literatures as well, right? The point, of course, is one of the things would be, and this is one of probably one of the strengths of both animal studies and Anthropoc Anthropocene approaches. And um, since we were talking about slow violence and, and, and Indira Goswami earlier, so I'll kind of refer to that story a little bit, right? So in some ways, one of the things that it has heightened more is that elements which are often considered non or simply settings, so to speak, are not so much in terms of the question of plot, because if you think about it in the short story, right, the setting is usually thought of as stasis, but plot is thought of as dynamic because the plot is said, said to begin, have its own time, its action, so to speak, in some sense, right? Whereas one of the traditional ways of thinking about setting is that this is stasis. It's the space, the container where things happen. But I love, there's a beautiful line in, in Gatri Spivak's uh, Death of a Discipline, the Planetarity essay. She says, for instance, even geological history is history. It's just that its rhythms are not quite discernible to us, so to speak, in some sense. So one way we could read this backwards is to say that even prior to what we can call the environmental term, the Anthropocene term, the animal term, whichever way you want to describe it, so to speak, that was there, right, and probably sometimes hiding in plain sight. But our humanist concerns very often obviated us to the presence of that, right? So one way of reading let's say something like ecocritism or Anthropocene backwards, is to actually think about those elements which lie hidden in plain sight, right? So that's one way of reading this question. The other point about this, of course, is what has happened in the recent sort of years, right? So obviously one of the questions which come up more and more with ecological consciousness, and also, let's say, research into animal consciousness and stuff like that, right? So, I mean, one of the things which I think is very, very pr productive, if you think about it, about whether you like the term Anthropocene or not, one of the very productive things is the kind of synergy that comes between the humanistic sciences and what were once called the natural sciences, so to speak. I, even in my paper, for instance, I begin by actually citing a lot of natural scientific literature before I get into the humanistic literature, so to speak, in some ways, right? So the idea, of course, is that this research into notions like other consciousness and so on, right, is something that has come up a lot. And that has, of course, influenced a lot of the writing that you see, which foregrounds animals at the center of the picture as well. Obviously, climate concerns are one major aspect, right? The question of the ecological crisis is one major aspect. And maybe one way we can think about it is the works have been responding to their time in some sense. Again, going specifically to Assamese, uh, uh, you know, Assamese literature itself, I don't think ecological concerns are something relatively new, so to speak, right? If you go back even to like the Assamese novel from the 30s and the 40s and the 50s, so to speak, there's number one people like that, right? Ecological concerns are very much present, right? So if you think about tea gardens and the way in which they kind of remake space, the tea gardens and the way in which they remake human relationships, so to speak, in some sense. So you already have ecological concerns coming out very strongly in these works, right? Or for that matter, if you read something like Hey Noti Nirubhati, which is by, by Nirupama Burgahai, it talks so much about, let's say, the behavior of the river. So you can almost think about flood fictions, and this is something that I would love to work on later on, as a kind of established subgenre in, in Assamese literature itself, floods and, for instance, both the productive and destructive potentials that is had, right? Khurz Mukir Hopna by Hopun by by Syed Abdul Malik, for instance, ends with this this image of the flood, but it is both life generating and life taking, so to speak, in some ways. So that you know, it's not that these concerns haven't been there; these concerns have been there, right? What we do see, though, post. 2000, right, of course, is a more probably a conscious effort to foreground certain aspects like that, right, like that. So they are presented, let's say, something like Sorai Saburi is presented as a novel about biodiversity in a way in which, say, let's say something like Hey Nodi Nerebodi would not have been, right? But it's, it's not necessary to say that it's something, it's a consciousness that has come now. But just like what I said, if you look backwards and you look forwards, 
These are consciousnesses which are already there, which lay, lay imminent, if you think about it. Or these are concerns which are already there, which lay imminent in these stories. The, pro, the it's, it's these new critical tools that we get with non-human theory, with anthropocene and stuff, right, that, that actually can allow us to read these texts differently as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, like uh, the question raised from actually from one thing I've been thinking that uh, since like in travel writing nowadays, like we get to see more about that. Uh, I mean, the, um, um, you I mean, the uh, more concerned about like the uh, species which are like uh, getting endangered, like the orchid things, like which are like getting rare and rare, like the species yeah. like they are the people are encountering during their visit to zoo and everything. So I was thinking that how like we can conceptualize these things also like in uh, this area or like and uh, perhaps like we can propose or something that new uh, genre of like this travel writing or something. Yeah. So the question I, I mean emerged from there actually. No, no, absolutely, and I think I'm I'm glad that you brought up not just the the extinction of fauna but the extinction of flora, right? So I mean in some ways. Extinction discourse is not just about animals. Let's not limit it to that. We can definitely think about it from the framework of plants as well. And in fact, plant studies is becoming kind of like a major feature in, if you think about it, in critical scholarship as well. How do you read the notion of plants, so to speak? That they, they. I mean, it's interesting to think about it. That you know, um, we were talking about my dogs catching at the door at the beginning, but my house also has a lot of plants. It's almost like an absent presence in my house, so to speak, in some sense. It's there, but not there, right, in some ways. But when you think, for instance, about larger frameworks of, let's say, nature and so on and so forth, right, obviously one of the factors of biodiversity and animals, given that they are moving beings, so to speak, they automatically come into the picture in terms of extinction, like the whole, and maybe here my own animal bias comes out, so to speak, in some sense, in reading the story. But what you say, for instance, orchids and so on, could be interesting to think about, let's say, the whole aspect of biodiversity and extinction also being reread through, let's say, the disappearance of certain quote-unquote local plants, maybe even the, the maybe even the arrival of invasive species of plants, right? Some invasive species definitely drive certain local ones out of extinction, so to speak. But it also, in some ways, changes social relationships, so to speak, right? So obviously, in a lot of the tra travel narratives that you pointed out, um, and some of them uh, I've read as well, is like, obviously, this comes out to certain signs of nostalgia, right? Of, of extinction often comes to signs of nostalgia. And nostalgia can be both, pro again, productive and a very conservative emotion. But what it could also do, so to speak, is to talk about you know, the question of historical change over a longer duration, so to speak. And therefore, that's where I think plants would definitely come fit into this equation. So thanks for bringing up this question, because I would definitely say that even my work on extinction, when I'm, I'm talking about species extinction, now that I listen to your question, almost all the texts that I'm reading are actually the extinction of animals. And I've never really thought about the question of plants. So thanks for raising that. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh... Actually, I think uh, we have one question here, perhaps like the recent uh, elephant attacks about it's from Tulika. So, uh, so Tulika is asking nowadays people attacks on elephant as we had seen in case of Kerala. Mm -hmm. They want to say that they used to do this for their crops and how can we brief them about what should to do or not? Okay. Of course, I don't have... Um that much of a knowledge about Kerala. So let me just start out by by, by confessing my ignorance of that, right? But, um, and, of, and I can't give a prescription of how people should behave either. But what I would say is an interesting factor that can come up to think about human-animal relationships itself, right? I refer to three things that, two things, two books that I teach often and one book that I reviewed recently, right? So, if you read The Hungry Tide by Amitabh Ghosh, there's that sequence in the middle where the tiger is caught, right? And is burnt alive, uh, burnt alive, basically, right? So, and then you have Pia, who's the American born naturalist who reacts with horror, right? Whereas, and at that point of time, Fokir is almost seen like a villain for her. I mean, again, Fokir, Fokir is also 
becomes kind of like the romantic savage for her, but that's a different matter altogether. But at that moment, it's like her romanticization of Fakir seems to kind of fall apart, so to speak. But one thing that moment does very interestingly when I teach it is that it stages different types of perspectives about human animal relationships. And here, I would definitely refer to the chapter on tigers in Anu Jalais's wonderful book, Forest of Tigers, where people talk, for instance, about how tigers have grown arrogant. Like there have been relationships between humans and tigers in the center of but how tigers have grown arrogant because of protection by the state and so on, right? So there's a way in which animal behavior itself is not a static entity. It also changes with material factors. It also exists in a coexisting zone, so to speak, between humans and animals and how they relate to them. So in this particular case of Kerala, which I don't know too much, right? It might be interesting to think about also the loss of habitats, which force probably elephants to attack, right? The status of people who attack them, who in some ways might be sometimes surviving uh, through, their, through their produce and so on and so forth. And I'll bring another example that I, that I recently read, and this is from Malini Sur's wonderful book called Jungle Passports, right? I read this book. And in chapter five, she talks about, for instance, elephant corridors in the Indo-Bangladesh borderlands and how the new borderland infrastructure, right? The fact that you have fences, the fact that you have electrified fences, distress animals too. The garos have particular ways of relating to, to, to elephants, right? For instance, she says that when uh, she was going to a forest in which is what is now Bangladesh, there was a garo person who called uh, elephants, uncle and aunt, and did not mention them by name. So there would be there would be re respect but fear at the same time, so to speak, right? So that element is definitely there if you think about it in terms of the relationship with elephants. But it's changed now, right? It's changed now with this electrified fence and so on. Elephants actually attack uh, human settlements more. And here, a lot of the border populations equate an elephants with Indian soldiers and their depredations. Right in the border, so to speak. So the the question about uh, animal attacks on human habitations, uh, the question about human relationships with animals, as I said, the question cannot be thought about thought about in that duality of humans as necessarily encroachers, as animals, as innocent. I think one of the most pernicious things that we can ever think about is the innocence of animals. Animals do have agency, so to speak, right? Innocence is a human category. It's an, it's an anthropomorphic thing. Obviously, it horrifies us when we say, oh, elephant was murdered, so and so, just like the, 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 the tiger was kind of burned alive and so on and so forth. But I think it's a much more complicated thing that occurs historically and socially in the interzone between what you call the human and the animal. This is the important thing to keep in mind. And I said, I, I'm working off very little knowledge of what happened in, in Kerala, because that's not really a, a region I research on. But I think there's something to be said about the complications of these factors as well. Uh -huh. OK, Arthrika, if you have any question or comments. Uh -huh. uh, not, not question uh, exactly, but uh, like the uh, talk about uh, elephants and tea gardens came up. I just also read that uh, now there's uh, some of the tea gardens uh, in Ashram as well as in Darjeeling, they're trying to make it elephant friendly by uh, introducing buffer zones or planting like bamboo trees or the trees, the leaves that uh, elephants love, like to it. Because for the elephants, the tea gardens are an extension of the habitat of the forest. So I think that's that uh, can be like say it's a one step forward maybe to protecting wildlife conservation. Yeah. Absolutely. I think we should have, we have to think about this within the framework of historical changes to the landscape itself, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I would say definitely that on the one hand, there's the question of uh, people and animals relationships to land. But there's also, if you think about with tea gardens, the reconceptualization of land as commodity and as property, right? So obviously, mm -hmm. when you think about tea gardens, they are the property of someone. Right? So if you think about it, it is in some sense an insertion into capitalist relationships as well, right? Whereas earlier sort of economic, political economic sort of formations, which impact both humans and animals, kind of fall aside on the shade, so to speak, in some sense. So obviously from one angle, this looks very benevolent, right? I mean, if you, if you think about it, it looks very benevolent in the sense that 
we think again it often comes from the assumption though that we think that animal quote unquote nature is not historical it's natural it's it's sometimes outside time and then by giving them corridors and so on we are recreating yeah, yeah. a life for them but what i think might be interesting to think about is how elephants react to that because elephant nature whatever or quote unquote the word which is so controversial in some sense i mean there's no human nature there's no elephant nature but when we use this word nature right it obviously brings in a question of timelessness lack of history and so on and so forth i think it's important here to think about how elephants themselves while themselves becoming commodities right or spectacles so to speak also react in some sense to the commoditization of space so i think it's interesting to think about the notion of benevolence also within those frameworks i think it's it's important to think of both let's say animal uh, behavior and so on as historical products rather than and this element of, of 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 pure nature right so we are bringing elephant habit i mean think about this concept of rewilding right which is there so much nowadays that oh let's yeah. rewild in the sense that let's try to recapture what was there in the past and that's a very nostalgic kind of endeavor which says that in mm-hmm. some sense that we can turn the clock back into a state of innocence so to speak right of course again there are much more complicated discourses about rewilding as well we can always think of it through two 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 or three different dimensions but the idea is that it's almost like a like taking you back in time to a time that no longer exists right and more often than not this goes back to the two kind of terms that we have in nostalgia itself which is like sertlana boym says that it's this conglomeration of two pseudo greek words nostos and algea right nostos is home algea is longing this idea that in some sense there was a wholeness earlier right from which we have fallen so to speak a very if you put it in in certain ways a very judeo christian discourse as well right that there is a paradise and that, that there be a fallen from that paradise yeah, yeah. so i think there's there's there, there are these factors which as i said i think it's a worthwhile venture to bring let's say elephant and claves and so on and we have to think for instance about how we cohabit with animals but let's not put this as an a historical question this is a historical question that changes both for humans and what we call the animal as well whatever animal form you're talking about that in many ways they also adapt the animal form also adapts in some sense with the shifts that we see for instance in landscape these are all historical products so to speak yes yes please and in fact that's, that's the way i would say so, sorry to interrupt but just as a thought yeah. i mean that's one of the one of the 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 i mean i think European theory has caught up with this very lately in some senses is this kind of you know sharp dualistic division of what we call human versus nature so to speak right that in some sense mm-hmm. time is on the side of the human nature is timeless and we all know like the pernicious kind of ideologies that have come out of that right whether we say it's colonialism the noble savage and so on and so forth but i said that the whole thing about animals needing our protection right is also in some sense a legacy of a certain form of colonialist discourse where we as colonizers extend is you see our our munificence our so- sovereignty so to speak to animals itself the human is always at the center and that's why colonialism will always be an anthropocentrism whether we think about it as a british one or indian one or whatever and this, uh, this concept of rewilding is very much uh, opposite to what started the tea gardens Uh-huh. civilizing uh-huh. Yeah, sort of turning an um, empire's garden as joita yeah. sharma says right the idea of turning yeah, it into yeah. garden and so on i mean it's so much implicated i think in this discourse of landscapism as well right this i mean, and i think there's there's a lot to be said about how space itself changes to the to the very you know kind of meticulous rationalized framework of the of the tea garden so i think joita's work book does a wonderful work in terms of kind of thinking about that as well right Thank you, Professor. Thank you. And uh, Pratima, do you have? Uh, I yes, think uh, King should have one question. thing on information to ask. Also, uh, yes. Unfortunately, I haven't read that. <laughs> King Shuk, I'm sorry about that. I haven't read that as yet. Uh, I just got Janaki Lenin's. Uh, a uh, novel and her recent book on animals by the mail from india but i haven't gotten to reading that as yet because i've been working on other things so so i can't i can probably try to you know 
if I uh, if I try to answer that question, I'll be doing so I'll, I'll be creating some fantasy words here. So I'll I'll let that pass. Uh, we have another question here from Rajeshi Borgohai. Uh, sir, would you like to comment upon the novel to the Elephant Graveyard by Tarkun Hall? Another hunting narrative set in Assam by a non-local author, which I personally found to be very prejudiced. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you, Rajeshi, for the question. Good to see you here. Um, um, it's true that a lot of the narratives that have come out, whether it's by Tarkin Hall, um, and uh, you know, still tend it still goes into this trope of what we can call the Northeast as unexplored territory, almost like a kind of dark continent, so to speak, in some ways, right? And I think this. This trope is so much there, so to speak, in a lot of travel writing, which often comes even now, right? Or for that matter, travelogues or or works on nature, which comes even now, so to speak, from uh, from uh, a few Western authors, not all, so to speak, in some sense, right? That in some ways, that element has never really gone out. That this seems to be almost like a space which has remains unexplored. So it becomes almost like a space about, about adventure and so on and so forth. And I think for me, one of the great things about Siddhartha Deb's uh, Outline of a Republic to bring another non-animal text was precisely a critique of that kind of view in many ways, so to speak, right? I wouldn't of course say that all works by non-local authors would necessarily be prejudiced, but yes, I agree with you that when you talk about like say the, the elephant graveyard, there's a lot about this which comes through this exoticization, both of the animal, of the elephant, and also the, the exoticization of, let's say, the animal handlers themselves. And I think that's not a novel I would like too much to tell you the truth. So I would definitely agree that um, it is, there are certain, I mean, more than the word prejudice, I would say it's the idea of a certain frame, if you think about it, right, that the author adopts in narrating the story, which is where a lot of the problems lie. But that can often come very much with travelogues or hunting narratives, even written by people from that region as well, right? Very often I start many of these works, even on Murdin Choudhury at some point, say, this is the unexplored portion of the Northeast and so on. Whenever I hear this unexplored thing, it's like, you know, this colonial kind of adventurous trope, which comes up very much so. So I wouldn't word, use the word prejudice. I would definitely say that in many ways, it's a certain frame, which is very orientalist in many ways. That comes up a lot in Dark and Hall's novel. Okay, uh, we think we don't I have, have any more minutes because I'll have to rush from the interview after this. So, if you have one last question or something else, second. Uh, uh, no, I think uh, we don't have question, but uh, Tulika is like have one comment lastly mm -hmm. uh, after your response. And uh, one thing, uh, lastly, I might I want to add here uh, mm -hmm. in our platform that during uh, one lecture, Professor Dilip Menon like mentioned that. During uh, his lecture on world literature and thing, uh, he was mentioning that if you like consider or uh, rethink about the world literature category per se, then perhaps we might include the human fauna and everything. And we mm -hmm. like need to reconceptualize the world literature canon from their part things and like including them. And perhaps that will uh, help us to, uh, uh, I mean, shape re uh, world literature in a new way. So. I I was like thinking these things since like where uh, and I today really agree that. with that because I would say that I mean if you specifically think about the notion of worlding right it's not simply the question of human worlding that we are talking about right that in many ways I mean let's say even if you're reading about someone like Jacob Uxkol right Jacob Wanoskol and the way for instance he thinks about the ticks right how for instance the ticks um wealth comes into being, so to speak, in some sense. That is a specific form of worlding, but it's our anthropocentric, probably, prejudice, if I were to use Rajasri's word here, right, that impels us to think that the worlds are only created by us. It's like what Heidegger says, the stone has no world, the animal is poor in world, only the human has world. And that's the most one of the most anthropocentric set, set, you know, formulations that you can find. But I think the notion of worlds and how it can be remade from the standpoint. I mean, you can, there's been uh, this, this wonderful book called Animalia, which I read recently, which is about, you know, colonialism told specifically from the standpoint, not so much from the standpoint of the animals, but the thing, for instance, about its impact on animals, so to speak. And I think it tells us so many other stories, so many other stories can be revealed through that as well.
So I completely agree with that statement. Okay, uh, Professor, uh, we, we also have to... Yeah, uh, well, uh, before, uh, uh, yes, uh, Pratim, hello. I'd like to show his comment since he was yeah, listening yeah, to yeah. our... Basudev, I know Basudev, so hello again. And uh, I know that he's translated a lot of stories from uh, SMBs to Bengali. So good to see you here. Thank you. Yes, yes, that's so... So I was like uh, really uh, I mean, eager to join this lecture. So anyway, uh, I think we don't have uh, any more questions for today. So uh, we might conclude here today's session. And uh, if you permit, Professor, uh, then we'll go uh, proceed towards our um, vote, vote of thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. OK. Uh, Aratika, uh, if you can please uh, 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 deliver the formal vote of thanks to the participant and professor. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. A special thanks to Professor Bursha for joining us today. Uh, on the behalf of Calcutta Comparatist 1919 and its members, I'd like to convey our heartiest thanks to Professor Amit Kumar Bhoi Bursha for his excellent lecture. A big thank you to Professor for sharing your ideas and views on this area. I would like to express our gratitude to you, for Professor, for responding to us and also coming to our forum. We are really inspired by your great words. Thank you to all our audience on YouTube for being with us today. Here we officially conclude this session. A very good night to all of you and a very good day to Professor Bush. Thank you, everyone. We'll end this broadcast now. Thank you. Bye. I'll see you. Bye. Bye, Professor.